Hello, my friends. I'll leave this open. Oh, man, I'm like back to life now. My sinuses are resonant. Uh, I'm all cleared out. Slowly getting back to work, getting my energy back. It's good to be uh, back on with John today. Jump on in a moment. How's everybody doing? Yo, yo. What's up? What's up? What's up, Hex? What's up, everybody? Hey, Casey, Iggy, Emily. What's up? A whole bunch of people jumping on. Yeah, it's been uh, it's been nice. All those people who are not in Los Angeles. Um, the weather is beautiful. It's gonna be like seventy-seven and sunny today. So uh, this is why I came back for the winter. My sinuses are clear. The sun is shining. Back to yeah, heading to the studio later today. Love that. I'm, I'm here, man. You know what it is. How's everybody doing? I saw some uh, some people posting in New York and elsewhere. It's nice and uh, nice and cold. Um, hope everybody's layered and staying warm and staying safe. All right, I'm grabbing John here. Hey, hey, well, Dan, like we hair. back. Oh yeah. There you go. You're, we got product going on in there. Oh, it's a little. Hey, yeah, you look, yeah, you look good. Tamed. Well, it's uh, it's funny how much like uh, <laughs> like several people every time I have veins on asked about his beard his beard products. So uh, now you got, now you got hair product going. We might just turn into like a, like a beauty show. <laughs> <laughs> Audio beauty, how, how engineers take care of themselves for themselves. Cause they're alone all the time. How engineers learn about products only in their thirties. <laughs> um, every, every now and then my, my hairstylist, when she comes over and cuts my hair, leaves something behind. And I'm like, Oh, let me try this. So every now and then I, I put something in my hair. Who the fuck knows? Most of the time I've been wearing a beanie this winter. So totally. Well, it's beautiful today, man. Did you it's go so did you go, nice? Did you play tennis or anything? You get some exercise yeah. this morning. Nathaniel bailed on me for tennis. I went to the gym this morning, got out of the gym and I was like, what a fucking day. Like this, this week feels good. That la last week felt good too, but it was kind of a low key for me, at least. I mean, a lot of people probably relate, but it was a low key kind of, all right, let's get settled back into what's about to happen for the year. And today, I, or yesterday, I hit the ground running with I, like just thinking a lot, ideas on what this year should look like. Um, and today was you know no different than that. Just met with my manager this morning and going to be mixing Atmos all day today with Mike Miller. And I'm just I'm just stoked, just stoked to be back at it. What does uh, what, what have your thoughts been on what the year is going to look like? It's a good question. I mean, it's it's pretty it's pretty personal, but because of this um, platform needing um, all the all you the sure, personal, sure what you feel, you know, uh, for me, it's going to be a, how to be a bit more proactive um, when it comes to networking is probably the safest word to use, but a bit more on the outreach side of, hey, I want to work on this. Like, do you think there's a way to collaborate here? Mm -hmm. um, I've Basically, this is going to, this will probably make sense of it. I've been working for 15 years, 10 of which have been in LA or 11 in LA, six of which have been not with my mentor. And I mix hundreds of songs a year and I've never asked for a gig. Um, mm. And what I'm realizing from that is I know I can get, I get a lot of work. I can consistently work but consistently working on the records that I really, really not only want to work on, but feel um, like I could offer, like I'm the right fit for this thing. And instead of sitting back and waiting for people to maybe come to me, it's like, oh, I think that I'm good for this. I should reach out to the team involved um, and see if there's a way to collaborate. Um, and I've never done that because to me, it feels disingenuine to ask for anything but that's like a you know that's a and personal just, thing in general but also just it's uncomfortable to be like hey can i and people are some percent of the time gonna be like nah or just ignore you or whatever yeah. and yeah this is this is i'm really glad you're sharing this because it's something i think about a lot too i think there's the perception for a lot of young record makers of any kinds or artists or whatever that like you gotta hustle and then you get and then it's something different but the reality is no matter what level you're at, if you want to do the, you know, exactly what you want, you want to really pursue this thing, 
there's an element of sort of entrepreneurship slash hustle slash networking. And you don't have to be somebody who's like, you know, running out there and, you know, yeah, shaking I can't babies do that. and whatever. Yeah. Yeah. But, yeah. um, but there is an element of that at whatever level you're at, like there's no, even if you're at the very top, that run is going to be short lived because things change. So if you want to work on the most interesting things and pursue stuff, and it's not to say you can't get to a place where you're just coasting or your life priorities change or something like that. But just because you have, just because you're John Castelli and you have Grammy nominations and huge records and all that doesn't mean it stops. And I will also say that it is, I, I don't know very many people it's a tiny tiny single digit percentage of people who are very very good record makers and very very good networkers at the same time it's yeah. not they're not generally skills that go together and that's okay um yeah and, and i want to i want to yeah, not even use like I, I felt i feel bad kind of saying that word because that i think that implies what, networking like, yeah i think that it imp- does get it, a bad rap it, it implies you're you're seeking um uh the work like you're seeking um it, it's it's transactionary it's transactional um and i i don't want it to i guess i'm afraid that it comes off that way but that's it, not it what doesn't. i want yeah it, it, it's to develop new relationships and friend and friendships right in the community right so for me what i've realized is you know pre-pandemic you know most people on, on here know about the conversations um evenings not necessarily the podcast but i was hosting these things and um i would cook for a bunch of engineers and we would talk and there was no producers there right so i'm literally cooking meals and networking amongst my competitors right like no one there is hiring me uh they all want the gigs that i have or like have their own gigs that they're not going to give up to someone like me so this stemmed from the idea of like well, why didn't why, why don't I also extend out to producers and make them feel like, well, we should work with this guy because he also does this and he's mm-hmm. he's interested in this and he can share this and there's a mutual benefit relationship in there that work is also part of and instead I shy away from that because it feels like I'm supposed to I'm, that that's me asking for something versus no I need to learn to understand that I I and you. And, and people alike us um, have things to offer that other people also want, right? Like I, I'm a bit more on the shy side of like, wow, you still want to work with me? Oh, you like what I do? You know, I was, uh, um, I had a thought the other day that like when I cook dinner uh, for, for anybody, um, I'm, so, I'm shocked when someone says it's delicious, right? Like, like really, you like this? You know, that's my, that's my norm every now and then. I'll cook something and I'll take a bite and I'll be like, fuck, that's good. You know, and then you can acknowledge it, but that's the rarity. That's that. That's not very common. I'm always like, oh, this can be better. Right. That's a personality trait. This is just how I, you, a lot of us are wired. Like everything's to me, everything's not that good until it's great. Like good enough for me is not really an opportunity or it's like, that's not really what I want to uh, want the opportunity, sorry, given to me mm-hmm. to translate back to someone else. Like good enough is not really where I'm at. I think good enough has its place and exists for a reason. It could be good enough for the day, come back to it on fresh ears. This could be good enough for, um, you know, this needs to be out on a TV spot today, but it's not making the record yet. Like there are, I don't want to like discount the idea that good enough yeah. is, is, um, is only a negative, but I'm looking for great. I'm looking for billions of streams. You know, that's like kind of what, my um my drive wants us to uh achieve and i still think every time someone says that sounds great like whoa really are you sure like so (laughs) i want to get over that completely this year um and realize that someone is coming for me coming to me with an expectation that it will be great so why would someone come to you to me to tom elmhurst to you know whoever's whoever's working on the project for it not to be great. They want it to be great. So therefore, I know that I'm capable of delivering something great and I should take a little bit more ownership of that. So that's what I've been thinking about. Yeah, I, I think those are, that's a great, that's a great topic. I want to, I want to touch a little bit on the networking thing a, a bit more where networking or whatever it is, it's hard to, it's hard for a lot of people and me included, you included, I think most people to 
hold in their mind things that feel contradictory. And one of those things that is contradictory is it feels a little weird to go out and try to like promote yourself and to ask for work or to go say, Hey, let me do this. Let me, let me I really want to jump in. I feel passionate about this. And so there's a side of that where some people are doing that just, it's kind of bullshitty. It's kind of networking. It's very LA that, that cliche is, is true, but yeah. there it's not black or white between, Oh, I just love this and want to be involved. And Hey, I'm trying to get myself out there. They all kind of interrelate and it's okay that they do. And it's okay that it's a little uncomfortable. You know, I'm, uh, I'm working with an artist who, uh, is a relatively unknown artist um, that I basically, I wouldn't say I pursued him, but the way that I got in contact, I guess I did kind of pursue him, but uh, I followed him on Instagram and just started sharing his shit. Whenever he put something out, I was just a huge fan of it. And I was like, I love this. This is my favorite artist. People have been following me. No, no, I'm talking about, I don't want to talk about it too much, but like he and I did a couple of days in the studio. It was great. He's going to come by next week. He's going to play me his whole album. We're going to see what happens. And I definitely pursued it. I hit him up through DMs. Yeah. I found his manager through my management. I DM people that that followed. Like I pursued it, but it was from a place of like, I'm a fan and I want to just say what's up. And if I can be, a, and, and even, you know, we talked about it a couple of days ago. He said, I've got this album. I've already got the next album in process. Would you be interested in this and this? And I just said, look, I want to be involved. However, makes sense. If, yes. if, if, if you play me a bunch of stuff and I go, here's what I think. And you go, that's not it. Let's not do it. Let's work on some other stuff or I'll just be a fan or whatever. And of course I'm in a luxurious place where I have enough work and I have, you know, I have enough of a track record where I get more of those opportunities. But if you pursue those things, not as like, I just need to network so people know who I am and here's my resume and more like, I'm a fan of what you do. I don't know how it's gonna work. I'd love to work on something at some point. I, you know, you don't know me, but I'm, I'm just a fan. And if you show love and even if you're all you have to offer is love, that's a really powerful thing. I think, you know, it, it's been yeah. interesting doing these streams now for a year or two, or it's, we're, we're, it'll be, it'll be two years yeah. in a couple of months, I think. Yeah. Um, yeah. Which, which is crazy. And I built a lot of interesting relationships. And of course there's lots of people that reach out and say, Hey, can you listen to this? Can you help me with this? Can you help me with this? And there's nothing wrong with asking for stuff, but the answer is I get too many DMS now. And so I can't just offer. And I yeah. was listening to people's things for a while and it's just, it's things got too overwhelming, but now with certain people who contribute a lot on the discord or give back a lot, or like, you know, people who participate in the community in a larger way who offer things and say, I want to be a part of this. I will take extra time and give them thoughts and whatever, if I can offer something to them. And I think that idea of, just showing love and giving what you can is the way to do it. And if you go out there and pursue a lot of work, even at your level, at my level, whatever, there's a lot of people that are just not going to respond to your email or mm -hmm. not want to, not want to say no and just ghost you or just be That's like, I'm fine. not really sure. Or are you willing to do it on spec? And you're like, I really love it, but I don't love it. Do it on spec. Love it. Um, mm -hmm. And so, you know, you, you have to do that dance. And I think it's really uncomfortable for most of us and it's okay. I mean, it's like, yeah, it's 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 okay well, I wanna, to be uncomfortable trying to put yourself out there, but doing it anyway. I want to separate in my head, and I'm I'm sure this resonates with a lot of people. Um, the difference between like I think I conflate self confidence and confidence in general with arrogance, yes. right? So uh, I if I if I seem to myself being confident, I imagine it reads as arrogance. Um, yeah. and that is simply not true. And it doesn't make any sense that those two, those two things don't share the same definition. So why am I, why am I conflating those two? And I think there's a line that can be crossed there very easily. And I've witnessed it too often for me to feel comfortable with me attempting to like tread that line. But I think yeah. this year might be more treading that line and seeing, um, you know, how it's, uh, reciprocated and how, and how it's, um, you know, responded to because, again, back to what I said before, you you were talking about, um, you know, like we, we're fans first, right? So if you're reaching out, like you're doing it for the for the right reasons. Yes. Um, also, you reaching out or me reaching out to someone, they might feel honored and excited and be like, oh, I didn't even think this person would even want to work with me, right? There's yeah. that other side of it. And I want to understand that side more, that we're both here. We're both at the, at the same level. 
I think I can bring something to the table. I'm not going to do this if I don't think that I can offer something, right? I'm not yes. doing this just because I want to like overtake the game or something. This is well, like, let me, say, no, no. let me say also that, that, that it actually is okay to, to just show love and say, like I, you know, to to sure. not even say, and actually, important to do that as well. It's a, it's a bit of the treat everybody the same. Treat treat everybody. If this, you should treat people the same, whether they can do something for you or not. You know, there's all the adages about you can you can of judge course. someone's character based on how they treat people that they can't do anything for them. If you just show love and don't go like, hey, I want to work. Hey, I want to do this. You just go, hey, I love what you're doing and get in the habit of having that perspective then when you do something where it's like i love what you're doing i think i could offer something then you you know you're doing it righteously and it's the same thing with with feeling confident in what you're doing i mean i think i've made a few records that are as good as anything i could ever imagine making i think hold up against the best records of all time if i could be that mm -hmm. but but it's rare and most of the time i don't like the stuff that i do and most of the time it falls short but if I can go forward with the attitude of like, if this makes sense, I think we could do something really great and have that confidence. It doesn't really matter. I mean, it's important to understand how you how you communicate with people. But if people misinterpret it, as long as you're coming from a place of love and appropriate confidence, I think it's okay because people will misinterpret it. If you go out there and say, hey, I, if you feel that you're doing really good work and you go reach out to 100 people, some percentage of those people are going to be like, this guy thinks he's blah, 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 blah. But you know what? That's okay. That's, that's, you know, you can't, yeah. you can't please everybody. And I know that's a hard thing for you, but it's, but it's, you know, it's, it it's is. Tough that's, where people, it all stems. that's where it all that's stems where it all from. Stems. We're, we're all that way. Yeah. We're, we all have empathy and, and, and we, we want people to like us and all that kind of shit. But no, you still some people gotta... are very good with maintaining empathy <laughs> and being like, nope, I don't need this. And I'm not that person. You know? Oh man. I, 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 <laughs> I, I think, I know very few of those people. And even the people that okay. show it well, even underneath, they're like, right, fair. You know, so I don't know. It's, yeah, it's hard. Fair. Yeah. Putting yourself out there. Well, I'm glad you're doing that this year. I think you, you deserve to do that. You obviously, I think you have a lot of skills. I think, uh, you know, many of the people who watch these things obviously think you have a lot, a lot to offer. And yeah, man, I mean, like the, and, and I'm just, again, go ahead. No, you first. I was just going to say one of the, one of the ways, which is, uh, an unintended consequence and benefit from doing these things is the relationships that I've made. I mean, you know, being able to obviously get closer to you and, and learn more from you and getting to know Baines and Tizio and hung out with circuit this weekend, these people who watch these yeah. things and appreciate just doing it for the love, which is what this is all for. As I declare every, every week on the audio version of this, no, we're sponsored by nobody. We're not going to charge anything. This is all free. It's all just give mm -hmm. back. And because it's authentic in that way, and I really enjoy just talking to you and talking to other people, um, people feel that and they go, okay, there's something interesting happening. And I haven't pursued anybody of like, hey, can I now do this? But those opportunities are starting to pop out. And I'm not, I'm not doing anything other than trying to give first. And it's a really powerful way. And of course, like I said, it's been almost two years and I'm not like trying to receive something from this, but now there's these relationships and there's a, there's a track record and it's really interesting, but it's, it's really mm -hmm. about pursuing things for the love of them more than anything else. So, and I, and you do that obviously. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I, and that's what I was about let's, to let's say. Just, I, I do. Yeah, I know. I know. I, I, this is all, you know, out of context, this still makes sense, but in the context of coming out of a pandemic, this makes even more sense, right? Like, I, we used to do this. Um, yeah. I didn't as much as other people, but I still did. I'd still go yeah. places and meet people, um, but definitely not in the last two years. And no. what I was going to say is like, I'm coming at this from a genuine place of excitement. There's very few things I yeah. love more than mixing records, right? So I'm bringing my most amount of love and then a certain, the, the thing I'm most skilled at right? Like I might not be the greatest, but this is the thing I'm most skilled at. So I'm bringing all of that energy to the songs. They might as well go to the songs and records that I love. And that's kind of what I'm getting at is if I put that out there um, and not manifesting like I'm like some new age shit where I'm telling it to myself and it's going to work out. Like actually, no, tell the person that you think that you should collaborate with that I think we could do something great. And then see if that greatness can come, right? That's all. Yep. I'm just coming out of a pure excitement because um, I'm, I'm ready. Like I'm ready for this year and 
I've never felt like I've never had New Year's resolutions. I think I talked about this earlier last year on our New Year's episode where my birthday, I always think of like, as an actual New Year, where mm-hmm. my birthday is March 6th. It's coming up, turning 36 years old. I'm exciting. That's kind of when I reorient the shape of the year and the, and the flow of things and kind of assess and like where I'm at. But I feel good about doing that now after three weeks off like and spending holidays with my family. And I'm like, this is this is a new year. Something about this feels new. So that's fantastic. To share yeah. that share that energy here. And and as we've talked about a couple of times, once we get the next lull in this uh, in the craziness of the world, uh, we do need to do like a, a a live podcast, live event type of thing, and maybe have a little panel with some of the some of the homies who've been on here and and yeah. organize some kind of event. We'll we'll definitely keep everybody posted on we'll that. We'll be doing that. Yeah, we'll be doing that for sure. I'm sure you will. You will do many things uh, aside from that as well. But you know, it's 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 a it'll be a good thing to get people together and have some face to face and like feel people in a room with the windows open and low pandemic numbers and all of that. But we'll yeah, yeah. we'll make that happen. Yeah. Um, uh, somebody uh, somebody asked uh, just asked about the holiday. How how was the holiday? Uh, I like the question. Uh, how was your holiday? Did you guys go on Pro Tools much or not at all? That's a great question. Mm, good um, question. Did you not at Did all. you take time off? Did you Did you work at all? Did you have an extended no. period off? Um, didn't work at all uh, until last week from the twentieth. So the twentieth. So I guess that's two and a half weeks off. Um, came back did a few notes, trying to wrap up some things, and then this uh, last week, and then. Um, this week, I, I'm busy all week. So back, do you, back do you normally take that much time off? Was this a new thing? Do you always take that? What's the, yeah. what's your usual? It usually just works out that way. Like, you know, not being a beat maker, um, you know, when I was making beats and stuff, I would come back and just like start creating, but being on the mix side and kind of, um, allowing myself to only be there, um, because I did think about that actually this year. I was like, oh, maybe I'll come back and just fuck around. I'm like, that's not what you're doing. Like, I'm still in specialization mode and I'm not yeah. going to, I'm not going to be a jack of all trades. Um, uh, that's a choice that I'm making and sticking to. Um, so I usually do the last couple of years, I've taken this time to reset and then kind of ease my way back into, you know, going hard for a bit. So, um, and then also we talked about this over the summer, but going to Paris for two weeks was the first two week vacation or two weeks off I've ever taken that I can even remember doing. So I imagine this like the ebb and flow of the year. This is when people slow down, they reprioritize for the new year. And it's not like you're not working, you're, you're thinking I was, I was journaling, I was still exercising, I was communicating with my family and you know, there's other things that are taking the space of that. I did though, lay on the couch a lot so um that's you know something i really want to get better at in general that's a that's a good thing to be able to do as as i said i think maybe last week when i spoke to baines uh normally when the holidays come i get excited about um uh out competing everyone else like there's that i think the healthy competition of like you know when the grammys are happening when coachella is happening when it's the holidays i'm like yeah i'm gonna be in the studio but of course this yeah. time i had i had sinus surgery so i was just like yeah out, out. right right right, right. <laughs> you actually take, you usually take the opposite so I, I I took lots of time off too. I actually have yet to do a full full day in the studio, but I think in the coming days I will I will start to get back. I'm I'm a, a bit more behind than I anticipated, but honestly, the time off has has, has been good too. I read a lot and um, yeah, and did you know did a bit of meditating and journaling as well as as per usual. I jumped in. Um, my goal this year is to read my first uh, Dostoevsky novel. So. Oh. Um, serious business. Page, serious business. I'm 36 pages into a thousand page um, uh, book. Oh, Which man, book? That is a uh, the brothers Karamazov. Yeah. Uh, his last book. Um, I yeah. Um, so I, I just got to, um yeah. This is that's intense. So that's my goal this year. So I started that uh, during the during the week last week and moving very slowly. Like I have to have a dictionary next to me and looking up a bunch of words and. Um, so I would say that that's work because the brain is working. Well, I would say uh, I won't. Let's see. I'm not sure how much I can or cannot talk about. It. There's a there's a 
let's call it a video game project that's mm -hmm. kind of ambitious and wild that I got connected to a, a while back, which I'm kind of doing some consulting for, but I basically have homework to catch up on the influences of the people in the project. So I'm reading a bunch of sci-fi. Um, oh, which which I've read some before, but that's been I've, I've been basically you know it's a bit of work also, but it's also fun and interesting diving yeah. into other worlds. So I've been I'm reading my second second uh, long sci-fi epic novel right now, but I would like to read uh, Brothers Karamazov too. I've not read that. Uh, so uh, um, a man that I've listened to on podcasts that I find very um, to be one of the smarter humans uh, and more broad. Uh, spectrum uh, thoughtful humans uh, said that if you have not read the brothers Karamazov that you cannot be a complete human and when I heard that quote I was like when I heard that quote I was like that's really fucking bold I'm gonna read that book um, so I want to know what he means by that and already with the first 35 pages the introduction of who these um uh, who these characters are, I, I kind of understand the the archetypal nature of the three brothers and you know, you can you can gather what's to come when you once you get the introduction to these characters. And um, anyway, I'm I'm really it's, excited about that. It's a it's a favorite of one of my favorite writers, uh, Christopher Hitchens. So at some point I will. And of course, uh, somebody oh, cool. shouting out there, Rus Russian listeners, shout out shout out our Russian Russian fans, nice. uh, Russian listeners. Uh, um, but also, definitely I've heard the last. That... Yes, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. And I spent the last two years pretty much only reading nonfiction. So mm. I thought it would be an interesting way back into fiction, just reading, reading the greats. So Re reading some really super easy, mellow stuff like, Oh my God, it's so not mellow. It's heavy, so long hard. Russian literature. <laughs> oh, it's so poetic though. It's beautiful. Like the writing is a lot, like the sentences are so long and punctuated and gorgeous. I mean, the, I did the, the, the right research and found the best translation and it's just gorgeous reading. It's just very difficult. Yeah. Above yeah. My, Fuck my pay grade. Yeah, I, I doubt I'm ever going to learn Russian, but I also hear that actually reading it in the original is the like, that's yeah. the richest of the, but you know, I'm, 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 sure, I'm, never, I'm, sure. I'm, I'm never getting there. Are right, you want to jump into a... Um, oh, there was a good questions. question in the chat. There was actually was a really good question in the chat. Um, have there been any projects that because of creative differences you've had that you have to say, okay, I have to leave this project? And that just happened to me a few times at the end of the year. Um, so I just wanted to touch on it. Just the fact that like, hey, we like the rough better than this. And then the rough is just like the worst thing I could ever imagine putting out. Like if that's what your barometer is for something that sonically sounds good and interesting and compelling, then I don't want to be a part of your project. And it's not personal. It's just like, I can't, I can't imagine making anything sound like that, nor do I know how to do that. So therefore I'm not the right fit. And then you can pridefully stay in it just to make your money. Uh, um, or you can just bow out and say, keep your money. I'm not the right fit for this. And, um, I, I did that a couple of times at the end of the year because I, I didn't want to stress towards the end of the year. And I was on projects that I was really loving and enjoying, and I didn't want to take the energy away from that. So the minute that I got caught wind of that, we're just not the right fit. I definitely did. And it felt good. Um, and did it very respectfully. And, and, um, and that, it was a good exercise for me moving into this year. It's also some of the things I was thinking about um, this week, getting into this conversation, like we talked about a few of the things. Another one was learning how to say no based on that. When you just know you're not right for the job, I'm like let someone else, don't waste people's money. Like for me, I think it's going to be a, I don't even want the money. Like other yeah. people will say, no, I want to get paid for the work I did. Like I respect that too. For me, I think I'm just going to bow out um, and let them spend that on some other mixer. So, you know, yeah, I think someone else can and, get paid. And that's a good a good thing that is very hard to, it's very hard to do um, no matter what level you're at because there's so much pull to do the thing, to make the money, to what if it's really successful and then I turned it down. Um, but it's actually a really powerful, beautiful thing to be able to go, I don't think this is right. Keep the money. It's all love and and just push it on to the next thing but it's uh, it's hard to do that and that by the way this is also when people talk about making money look if, if you are a house engineer somewhere and you're on a salary and it's someone else's thing and and you got to mm -hmm. make your money or or you have very few gigs and you need to pay rent these are different conversations but as soon as you can do things that uh where you have enough money to say this project isn't right for me that's a really great thing to be able to do and start doing early on in your career and do it with love and let it, you know, and let it go. Because the truth is 
if you don't love something, you're not going to do very good work. I, I, I know, I know, I don't think I know anybody who doesn't, you know, who does their best work on things that they don't love. Like it, it's just, it's the only way to do what we do at the highest level. I mean, you know, you may, you could be a, an accountant or a plumber or other things and just like do the mechanics of it. But this thing being involved with making art, making, being in the entertainment industry and music industry, whatever, it's so competitive. And it's so much about the intangibles of excitement when things are happening. If you're not yeah. in there and excited it's just, it's very unlikely to be great. And so learning how to say, you know, it's one thing to take on a challenge and go, this isn't what I expected, but I'm going to move with it. And those are important skills to learn as well. But if something is just not right, like just, just yeah. move on from it and learn how to do that. It's a really yeah, important and, thing. And, and it's a, it's a mindfulness practice too. Being aware of when you're working on something and you get that feeling in your gut that you don't even know what to do. Like, or that you know that what you do isn't going to actually get the reaction that you want from this, then just be aware of it and back out somehow. Be I mean, really, you should be listening to the record. Like, in a perfect world, this is what I would do. This is what I would yeah. do in a perfect world, which is very unlikely. I would listen to the song, but not only listen to the song, I would actually ask for the session or the stems before agreeing. Because a lot of the time, the song can be great, but the, the baked-in nature of the record is so like distorted in a in not a cool way in a super loud way that just no real room to do anything and then i would make the decision whether i want to do it or not right and that's mm. a side of the relationship or where it came from i'm just kind of talking more like i actually i'm talking about all the projects yeah. i think if i could in a perfect world i would assess the record for what it is before in a perfect yes world every time in a perfect world it'll never happen it's <laughs> yeah. very rare you know, um, every now and then you get an artist that comes in and like plays you down their record and it's like, all right, it's time to mix this. And you're like, oh, let's open this one up before. And like, let's see. And oh, if you know the producer, you can go over to the studio that they're working at and check out their sessions and kind of understand what you're getting yourself into. But the projects that I turned down or had to say no to um, after starting them in December or November, whenever they were, I heard them in the car and my thought was, ooh, these sound wild. But like, I kind of like the song. Mm. One of them was from an, uh, a manager that I'm working with on another project who I like a lot. So I was trying to help out with that. Um, but I knew right away that I was like, uh, I don't know if this is for me. I do think, though, that if I brought what I can bring to the table to this, this could be a better record than it is sonically. Mm. So I definitely felt like if they liked, that's the thing. If you If you go into it imagining that, they're going to like or love what you bring to the table. That's the only thing we can, we can bank on, right? So I went into this not paying attention to the rough and saying, I think this is how the mix should feel. And they didn't agree. So that's yeah. fine. We can go our separate ways then creatively. I'm not going to be the person that just gives you that rough a tiny bit louder and more distorted than it already is, right? I know the times when the rough is great and you're only doing that 5 10% to make it that much better. But this example is not that. This example yeah. is this needs a complete overhaul. Um, and if you're not open to that, then we need the part ways. I think that's really what it comes down to. Well, and, and you're and you're speaking from the mixer perspective of wouldn't it be nice to have more of a conversation and investment and let's talk about what the project's supposed to be on every on every mix. I, as a producer, most of the time, I always do that. Um, you know, for right. example, this artist that I mentioned earlier, he's going to come by and he basically said. I want to finish my album with one producer. Do you want to do it? And I said, a hundred percent in principle, but you got to play me everything and let's, let's do it and see what your vision is and see if I'm the right person for it. It's a really yeah. important conversation to have. And again, you can't always do it, but the more, especially as a, as a producer and writer, I mean, look, if you're having writing sessions and your publishers, just, your young writer publishers just setting you up with something, you go kind of do the speed dating thing. That's totally fine too. Um, but at, at my where I'm at in my career, like I want to have a conversation with the artist. I'd like to have a conversation with the manager or the A and R, whoever's on sort of like the business label side, because getting a sense of who's really pushing for what. And oftentimes I'm getting, oftentimes I'm getting asked to finish records, which is okay. Who's pushing for this? Does the artist think it's done, and the label doesn't think it's done? And so mm -hmm. I got to talk to the artist and say, look, I'm not trying to mess up your record. You know, there's it's a lot of work. Art. There's a lot of work, but I love that. I mean, you know, it's, yeah. you know, it's, that's, that's part of what but I love about the process. You have to be more picky of what you get involved in because yes. those projects can take you months versus mine 
weeks yes. to a month, depending. Can be yes. months, but not months consecutively. Like I have a lot more conversations time. that don't turn into work where I yes. could probably just say yes to all of them or figure out how to say yes and then not do great work and it would be a long process. Yeah. And by the way, you, as, as a whatever level you're at, especially as a producer, but I imagine as a mixer as well, there are there are projects which are like, this looks great. And then you get into it and you're mm -hmm. almost done. And then like the notes are 15 rounds and you're kind of pulling your hair out and you just go, okay, I'm so far into it that I'm not just going to back out now. I'm going to finish the job and Have then to. reevaluate the next time it comes around. So, you know, yeah. as much as it is like, there's conversations where I go, maybe I'm not the right guy or, you know, it, uh, we can't do the deal quite right for the kind of investment of time that I need to put into it. or I'm not as passionate about it. There's also the stuff where when you get to the end and you're just like, oh, I should have said no to this a month ago. This one song, I've gone through three productions and they're, it's, I'm not very happy with it. And I think they're happy with it, but they don't really know what they want. And I'll just finish it out to yeah. the best of my ability and then reevaluate the next time. You don't want to be so, you, you always want to leave on a good note. If you're saying no early on, you say it with love. You say, I don't think I'm the right guy. I appreciate you guys. Keep me posted, you know, whatever. Yeah. Um, or if it's at the end, you just get it done at the end. And then the next time they come around, you go, I don't, I don't think I'm the right guy for this. And that, and that happens yeah. a lot. But, but that, those conversations of like really getting invested in what the pro project is and what they want to do is what I love about it. I mean, there are producers, I think, like producers and writers and people like, I don't know, Pharrell. I mean, and like, I don't know Pharrell, but you know, Pharrell has so much of his own artistic thing that he puts in to a lot of the records that I think there are producers out there that are almost more artists they're much more artists than I am. So I like to go in and help someone achieve their vision. And if they don't have a vision, it's not great for me. But there are mm. producers that go in and go, I can provide the vision for you. I can give you the aesthetic mm -hmm. and you can, you can do so. There's, it's mm -hmm. different for everybody, I think, is, is, is the point. I want to quickly answer Windsor's question because I mixed a song for him. And he asked, did oh. next year, this is the Macklemore song that he featured on, need a complete overhaul? And I want to give a shout out. Ryan Lewis is one of the best in the game that yeah. did not need a complete overhaul. That shit sounded so tight and it was so fun to work on because of that. And Ryan and I go way back and we've probably mixed like 50 songs together at this point. Like mixing for Ryan Lewis is a fucking pleasure. Shout out Ryan Lewis. Yeah, just big shout out there. Um, okay, let's, uh, you want to get into a couple little question things? We haven't, uh, oh, I like this one a lot because we could talk about, uh, have you listened to the Weekend album at all? Yeah, almost all the oh. way through. So someone, uh, I, I believe the, the their handle is super tight which i also like um <laughs> 1980s arrangements make me excited how can we achieve it with that modern loudness um i mean i think the weekend the production i really like on a lot of it i think they did a pretty a pretty great job um some songs i like more than others i'm still absorbing it um i like that it's a full album that sort of thing but but and and i also think that that uh to a lesser extent ian kirkpatrick on some of the the dua stuff where i wouldn't say that it's it, it's incredible some of it is not like quite as purely 80s throwback it's much more kind of a hybrid going to the the modern era but um but there's some there's some really good stuff there's really good 80s stuff do you have do you have thoughts and i feel like you and i have actually talked about 80s sounds and production and mixing before but 80s sounds and loudness certainly the, the kicks and snares yeah. have the same sort of compression and uh, and in your faceness as a lot of modern things, but somehow the weekend's done a good job. Ian's done a good job. There's a few people doing, I think, good records. You got thoughts on that generally? Yeah, I, I yeah, I mean, I, I was keeping the name of the artist out like uh, five years ago, like developing an artist that was going for like not going for like literally the same exact sounds that the weekend just put out and we had and i have unreleased 14 songs on a hard drive of those sounds and that's what we were going for it was like how do we reinforce that right there was there's layers it's like well use a 909 kick drum the 909 is pretty fucking fat right um or if you're using a 505 that's smaller um let's uh reinforce it with more of a hip-hop punchy kick and layer that in and figure out the phase so it works right there's ways to do that um the thickness uh in a lot of the like dx7 um the, the dx7's pretty thick and juicy sounding like a lot of the roland stuff from that era actually does sound good i think that in the 80s um people were turning up the brightness on eqs on consoles so much in the studios that that's what was giving it that 
kind of cheap, thin sounding. I tinny, think actually, tinny thing. Yeah. The, all that tinny thing. I actually think that was post production um, and 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 processing. I think the actual instruments themselves have a lot of body. Like that, the, I think it's called the rubber bass sound. It's on um, one of the Roland keyboards. Uh, uh, one of the cheaper, not like the the 106, not the classic ones, like uh, some of the more off off um, off the radar ones. The rubber bass is so sick. I think it might be DX7. I think it is a DX7 rubber bass. So that's what's on the um um on like the I think it's the one that's on the Kavinsky like um uh, uh night talk song night, night call the, night call night call night call song like night call? that's yeah. in one of the records on the weekend. It's the same sound. Those sounds are fat. So I don't actually have, think that there's anything really to to do except for add more low end and, and warm up the sound. Also, so that's what the, the weekend did. It's the, the, the warmness thing. And I think, uh, and if there's anybody that was around in that era making records, they could correct me, but I believe eighties was really the era where people moved away from tube mics and tube stuff. And we're yes. using FETs and more solid, solid state, state. And, exactly. and, and, and using fewer tape machines and things like that. And what yes. you get, and, and, you know, so you get a clearer, cleaner thing, but as we now have everything in computers, a lot of people, as we talk about all the time, have gone back and realized that the saturation and dynamic range compression you get from tape machines and tubes and now emulated in computers is a really pleasing thing. And so a lot of those 80s records sound more crisp and clear and sometimes tinny and harsh because they're throwing lots of bright EQ on and there's some extended low end, but it's missing a lot of the tube and tape squishiness and compression and thickness and richness that you get from that harmonic saturation and now people are moving some of that back in um yeah. i think you know again i don't i don't know the processing on the weekend record but it sounds really good and some of it does sound kind of retro and he's singing like the pet shop boys on that first song and yeah, some yeah, of it's yeah. kind of it's it sounds kind of goofy and interesting and different and confusing but some of it sounds also a lot of it most of it sounds well very let's not modern. forget Let's not forget that in the 80s is, you know, cocaine 80s for a reason, right? So you're in the studio, you're doing a bunch of lines of coke, and your senses, your hearing is being dulled by all of that. So they're turning up like that's, that's like what Questlove talks about all the, the decadal histories, um, history of, of decades of music, like which drug was kind of in charge in the studio of that in yep. the 80s is coke, right? So cocaine all that right. brightness, and, and then that goes with the exactly, and that goes with what you're saying is all this boost, um, all the high end boosts are happening not into a tape machine per se, but that's how the practice was. Like, oh, well, there's no tape or tubes to suck up this brightness, so it's just gonna go, and it gets crazy gnarly. And it's um, so I actually don't think that's natural to what those sounds. Like going back to what I was saying, um, were happening when I listen to the. Let's talk about the weekend album for a little bit because, yeah, yeah uh, as Kit Cutler said, the best serving in a hot minute. The mixes are really good. Um, I I've been. A, I was talking about this with Mike Miller yesterday because. I'm such a hater on like all modern mixes coming out and until something's great. So I yeah. want to talk about how I think that these records are pretty great sounding. They really I, are. I still, I, um, I still think like, you know, when I listen to the PMCs, I, there's a bit too much upper bass for me. And I wish there was a bit more sub in some of the records and that translates on different songs, but I want to like give credit where credit's due. This is as good as mixes get right now in that pop worlds with all that density and jam pack. I think, they sound tall. They sound deep. There's a lot of dimension to them. Um, Serban's style is very compact. And within that kind of vignetted window and that shape that he does, there's a lot of movement going on. Do I think personally that the space could be a little bit bigger? And I can, you know, I can comment on that all day. It's not necessary. It wouldn't, I don't know if it's going to make the records any better. Yeah. Um, so I think sonically speaking, it's very, very good. Um, I'm not overly inspired by it enough to like, it doesn't fuck my world up good. Yeah. Um, you know, that hasn't happened in a long time, sadly. I'm, I'm still waiting for that record to happen. Um, but I think the arrangements and the production is really great. My only issue is that none of it sounds um, innovative. Um, mm. It sounds like a copycat. It sounds yeah. like we, we went back to, like you said, Pet Shop Boys and Depeche Mode. And it sounds like things that we've already heard before sounding pretty similar to the way that they sounded. Um, and I don't like the majority of the lyrics. So it's hard for me to wrap my head around the weekend um, over these like kind of darker harmonics and these sounds, these interesting complex arrangements with these like really simple lyrics on top. It just doesn't feel right to me. So I'm, I'm having a hard time with the, 
the songwriting nature of, of the album, though I think the production level is, is pretty, um, pretty high. But again, not innovative. There's nothing about it that's like, whoa, I've never heard that. It's all sounds that we've heard before. And for us that grew up listening to 80s music, um, you know, I think there are sick moments. Uh, yeah. There's a moment, I love the concept of the whole Dawn FM thing and like the transitions and the radio programming is super cool. I forgot what the name of the song is offhand right now, but there's a time where he's like, we're going to go into easy listening now. And like he takes it down it gets slow yeah i think those those two songs that come after that are super boring and i could have done without that whole bit but what i'm getting at is after that there's a crazy arpeggiated bass sound that has so much top end and it's so gnarly and i'm like that's the shit that's fucking bold like on take yeah. my breath away when the when the hook comes in and the melody and he stops singing and that synth pokes through with those eighth notes doing that counter melody it's fucking bold and too loud and it's sick and that's what yeah. the 80s were about. They were all bold moves that jumped out of the speakers. Not Probably not even intentionally. It was probably like laid down and then left alone, which is super cool. We've talked about that in some um, Bruce Swedean mixes on Michael Jackson where the shaker is just so damn loud. And you're like, all the percussion is so damn loud. But if you're at low volume, you hear Michael and you hear energy. And like, yes. where's the energy coming from, right? Yes. So I think the weekend, there are moments on that album where whether it's a Serbin choice or a Max Martin choice, or I think Swedish House Mafia's drums on that record are the best sounding drums in a long time. Those sacrifice drums and the um, whoa, whoa, how could I make you love me? I think it's the other one that they they produce. Like the drums are ridiculous, and that's some of the best pop drums I've heard in a while. Um, but they're bold; they're not subtle. And I don't know if if Serbin maintained that what he did to it versus the production, but leaving those bold moments alone uh, or emphasizing them is what makes music to me feel, uh, feel compelling. And yeah, but there, I think there could have been more moments on that album where that happened. I think mostly it's safe, not innovative, but a solid album. Yeah. That's my I, opinion. I, I, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I, 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 I agree with a lot of that. I think uh, you're absolutely right. It's, it's the, I think the, the Serban mixes are really great. And, getting back to what we were talking about before there's a real vision with the album and yes. vision is something in record making these days uh that's it's i wouldn't say it's in short supply but it's just not you know things are a bit more label and social media driven and single and viral driven and so to have an album that's like i'm doing it like this it's called this it, there are transitions songs blend together there's Jim Carrey playing a radio DJ throughout the whole thing. I actually think that that last track where he kind of reads the poem is fucking yeah. amazing and beautiful. It's amazing. It's um, beautiful. And there's, there's real vision. And uh, I like a lot of other things about the album, but if nothing else, the vision that he, uh, the, the weekend achieved is really impressive. And um, the other producer is at one Otrix point never who did it with yeah. like shout out to yeah. him. I think it's, I think it's a guy. Um, I mean, he and Max Martin executive produce with Abel. Yeah. Uh, it's a, it's a, it's a really great achievement. I, I don't have a sense yet of if the songs are really going to explode and last, but in terms of making a great album, I just don't know yet. Cause I haven't really yeah. absorbed it. Um, but I, but I vision and sonically it's exciting. And it's exciting to see someone at a high level do something that just isn't down the middle. Um, and even if it's a kind of retro throwback, yeah, shout out Oscar Holter too. Like, the, the, there's some really cool stuff on that. Uh, really cool stuff on that album. I'm definitely going to listen to it more. Just it's interesting to see people innovate. It's it's something that is a rare. It's a rare thing. This is why I continually love Kanye and Will Forever because he's not a guy who's ever going to follow. It, it, one of his great quotes is "Trend is always late." That you just you're not going to get if you're trying to make something that feels contemporary you're already behind because that already exists and whatever you're going to yeah. do is necessarily going to be after that. So I love that the weekend, even if it's kind of eighties throwback and those of us that know those records go like, cool. I, I like Depeche mode and, and those things too. It's really cool for him to like bring it into a modern context, have a vision. I think it's dope. I think it's really dope. Yeah. Uh, let's I see. Uh, I want to run through a couple of questions that I can just answer quickly. Uh, Kurt asked, when in your career to hire a manager as a mixer and what are the benefits it provides you? We did, two hours uh one of the episodes maybe someone in the chat can do it on the music business where we talk about our journeys with managers and attorneys i think that's really valuable um so you know one of the things we're getting to the point now where 
I think this will be the 78th hour of conversation, most of them with you. We've talked about a lot of these things. So I really encourage people to go back and check out the two we did on the music business. We talk a lot about managers and lawyers and, and how you put together a team and that sort of thing. So check that out. Um, Alkaline Wave asked any advice for people with uh, tinnitus. We've talked about it a little bit before, but there's a great, there's been some great discussions on the discord um meditation certain kinds of magnesium there's people on there so please go join the discord there's a link in the in the live with matt rad instagram bio um asking about hearing loss we also i've talked about it with tzio a little bit who has an imbalance from a childhood ear infection we talked about on our episode you can still make not still you can be at the highest level making amazing records with quote unquote incomplete hearing or whatever so don't let it get you down there's uh there's lots of amazing yeah. people with tinnitus um there's another question. Nuga asked, uh, any alternate monitors to PMC as they are too expensive for beginning level, beginner, beginner level engineers? And the answer is, of course. There's lots of um, totally usable things in the $1,000 range or less. I don't have a great idea on those because I'm not in the market for them. But again, the Discord is a great place. We've got a whole monitoring yeah. section. People are talking about uh, different kinds of monitors and what they're using. Um, uh yeah so those are the quick ones i wanted to just run hey, matt. through yeah hey matt i have to use the restroom i have to pee really bad so i'm gonna go really quick okay go so do keep it. going through go do it um yeah the, by the way the, the discord we're at about 750 people we're trying to continue to make it feel like a small community where people are really helping each other out it's uh we do a little bit of a dance periodically on trying to keep it away from being spam, but it seems like people are really still getting a lot of value out of it and helping each other out, which is fantastic to see. So a lot of these questions that we get every week about what monitors should I get, how what mic should I get? Have you heard this gear or have you used this piece of you know, this piece of gear or have you heard this plug in? Um, the discord is just a great place for that. Cause there's, yeah, we, 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 the biggest, there's a, the discord crew is out in the, uh, in the, uh, in, in the chat right now, but it's a great place. And people are excited to talk about, uh, all kinds of things. You got questions about specific plugins. There's a question. Uh, somebody just asked, what are people's go-to delays and, uh, reverbs and somebody, we, they wrote a really long thread. Everybody was putting in their favorite delays, favorite reverbs, um, and giving plus ones to different things. So it's a really super useful place. So please, please check that out. Um, awesome. John question for you. Uh, a quick one. I, I have not used a slap delay on vocals in so long, but I realize I always should be trying it. Do you have a go-to for that? Do you use a, do you use slap much? Do you, I did. I don't much, but I just did on that on that Windsor so, um, Macklemore song we were talking about that Ryan Lewis produced. Um, I I used a slap in one of the sections. I made it myself with um, the Valhalla delay. Yeah. Um, and I tend to either just keep it mono. Um, you know, with that you can make it wide. They have that time delay function on it, um, or I'll send it to an H three thousand and. No, make yeah. the slap kind of feel uh, feel wider that way. Um, yeah, I like slaps. I like slaps a lot, actually. I don't use it enough, um, but I definitely do. There's another question about reverbs. Dylan asked, um, discrete versus shared reverb sends on vocals, uh, lead versus uh, backgrounds, or do you have like master reverbs or uh, not just for you, but how do you get them presented to you? Or do, are people usually having one reverb for the lead vocals, re one reverb for all vocals? one reverb for the whole track does it, I mean, it presumably it depends i've certainly had it in all kinds of different configurations but do you have thoughts on that generally mm, i don't know thoughts i feel like reverb. a lot of, a lot of times if there's if an instrument needs to have a particular sound and create a space for it sometimes like a a mono spring reverb yeah, to make it sound sit there um but generally I like to not have too many different reverbs swimming around. Uh, sometimes a few different delays that will ride up and down depending on the part or depending, certainly reverb throws or delay throws are kind of a different thing. But in terms of overall, I try, like we talk about with a lot of things, the, the more you can achieve with fewer ingredients or fewer moves, the better yeah. off you are. So I try to keep it minimal if possible. I'm a big fan of uh, duplicating the track and messing with a reverb or an effect on it um instead of sending to a bus mm. so i'll take a synth that i think needs more reverb or more space and i'll duplicate it and i'll just put a reverb on it 
and I'll adjust the fader level um, and, and sculpt that shape with the track right below it. I'll just color code it a little different so I can see it. So that's the way I go about things. Um, that's a bit of a, uh, unconventional approach. I don't really make many reverb sends. I only have about four effect sends or five maximum in my template. Yeah. Um, eighth note delay, quarter note delay, half note delay, H3000 and one, um, Bercasti reverb that I like. Um, yeah. and a lot of times they don't get used cause I just duplicate, but so I'm like, Five out of 10 times, none of them get used. Seven out of 10 times, only the reverb gets used. And then like two out of 10 times, I'll add delays as well um, with them. But a lot of the times I do and create my own spaces around instruments and vocals. I'll do background vocals and, mm. and put a delay on them instead of using one of the ones I have in the template. So I'm more of a every mix is different kind of thing. Yeah. Um, and every sound uh, wants its own thing. That's actually a really... I had not thought of it this way. We talk so much about, okay, don't just reach for a compressor if you're trying to um, contain the dynamic range. Like to do dynamic range compression, you don't have to use a compressor. You can use clip gain and saturation and clip effects and a limiter. And there's all different ways to do it that might be better than a compressor, which was the only way to do it 40 years ago from the beginning of recording up until about 40 years ago, or maybe 30 years ago. Um, I had yeah. not thought that using reverb and delay sends is actually a thing from having not a lot of channels on a console from having sends on a console. There actually might be better ways to do that where you've, unless you have a track limit, but those of us, I mean, you know, I'm speaking only to the very, the, the sort of beginners, but you know, if you have any of these programs, you have essentially unlimited tracks why not just use a hundred percent reverb send on a duplicate of whatever you want reverb on and adjust it from there. I'm going to start doing that more. I didn't think about that because send sends. I'm so used to it because I learned from a guy who mixed on consoles and now I do it in pro tools, which really pro tools was built to be a virtual console. But if you, exactly. you know, if you don't approach it from, okay, we have, you know, six sends because it's a console and however many returns, you can actually just make an individual reverb track or delay track for anything you want to reverb delay on. I'm going to start doing that more. That's actually a great Yeah, one, of the, one, te one quick geeky technical thing with that, though, is for plug-in delay compensation issues with different um, manufacturers of plugins. Uh, hmm. When you duplicate, duplicate with all the plugins on um, and then uh, uh, do work after. Do like that. a rend like render it, do a, do a commit, commit the track or something like that. Where you, no, um, I just duplicate it with plugins, so it's yeah. the same phase. It's the same delay compensation. Yeah. Um, it, I haven't experienced it too much without because I don't use UAD plugins anymore. But with UAD, there was a lot of phasing issues on duplicates um, without having the plugin. So I don't use UAD at all. So I haven't noticed it, but that's out of habit. I would just check that when you're duping, keep your plugins on, and then affect after the fact. Yeah. Interesting. Interesting. Uh, we got like two minutes left. See, so we can just run through a couple other things. Um, Tony asked, I'm a producer, artist, engineer, and don't know how to deal with all of these help. <laughs> uh, I, I like this question because we've talked about versions of it before, but I think the answer is just start collaborating with people and you'll find where you want to outsource stuff. I actually think, uh, you know, as I've said before, if I were 15 now, I would be an artist, producer, engineer, fashion designer, YouTuber, you know, dancer. I would just do everything. I would do whatever felt interesting because you should just be pursuing everything until it gets overwhelming and you have enough knowledge of them. You know, John became a mixer because he found that that was the most satisfying to his brain and his workflow and his satisfaction of work coming out and that sort of thing. For me, I'm still kind of all over the place. I'm not an artist. So you remove the artist part. That's a big part. It's very hard to be an artist and producer and engineer, but pursue these things and start collaborating with people and see where you naturally fit more comfortably and more satisfyingly. Um, it's okay to be doing lots of things and not really sure how to manage them all. But once you start collaborating, you'll start to go, oh, it's really nice when someone else mixes the thing, or it's really nice when I don't have to think about me being the artist and writing the lyric or whatever it is. So I would say people are in that position, just collaborate and you'll find your natural place for that. Yeah. Um, let me see. There's one other one. Oh, maybe we can just do this for the last one. We're, we're at about an hour. Um, this might be a long one too. So you could, we can mix it for the next time. When do you use subtractive versus additive EQ? 
how do you think about those? Let's talk about that next week. Okay. <laughs> we'll save that. There's, a, there's, a, there's our teaser. There's our teaser for yeah. the next week. <laughs> um, appreciate you guys for, for jumping so. on. Uh, good to see you, John. And uh, let's, uh, when, when are we having dinner? Are we going to have dinner next week? Uh, yeah, next week. Next week. Let's do it next week. All right. Uh, love you, John. Yeah. Good to see you. Thank you, guys. I'm going to jump you. on the Discord after and uh, say what's up. Thanks, guys. Cool. Bye-bye.